Welcome to this uh, extra lecture, which is an addendum to the Biotech Plenary for Technology and Civilization II. It's possible that you've heard that the world is currently facing a pandemic, the COVID-19 or Coronavirus Disease 2019. I myself was already in self-quarantine on this leave, on leave this semester with my newborn baby, who is blissfully unaware of what is happening outside of our house. So I'm Zach Froelich. And today what I want to do, um, since I didn't have time to rewrite the usual lecture on biotech, was to provide a separate additional lecture giving some historical context for our present crisis so that you can think about how past societies have faced similar problems and overcome them. So this plenary is going to be a bit unconventional because I'm going to mix in current events and news with historical analysis than I, more than I usually do. Here you can see a graph comparing the causes of death in 1900 with the causes of death in the United States in 2000. And you can see a dramatic shift. So you can tell that on the lower left on the 1900, the, the three main causes of death in the United States were tuberculosis, gastrointestinal infections, including things like cholera, and pneumonia and flu, and they were a much more significant cause of death than 100 years later. So you can see here a dramatic shift over the course of the 20th century in the burden of disease that the Americans faced. Uh, turn to the 2000s, and what do you see? You see chronic degenerative diseases like heart disease, including heart attacks, and cancer uh, being the largest causes. But you can also overall see a, a reduction overall in death. So people are living longer lives and because they're living longer lives, that's why they're dying from chronic degenerative diseases more than these uh, acute infectious diseases that you see on the left. Historically, epidemics played a much more significant role in the lives of people in the past than they do today. They were more routine, but also when there were outbreaks, the outbreaks were much more severe, and these kinds of severe disruptions were much more common. To give you a sense of this, what I thought I would do before going into a more concrete history is just show you a, a sort of survey of classic literature uh, related to pandemics at different points in time. So here you can see four novels which take as the main point of the plot some kind of pandemic, and you have people and characters in these grappling with this and making sense of it. Uh, the most sort of classic one of this is Boccaccio's The Decameron, it takes place in Italy during the Black Death or the bubonic plague. So this is in, published in 1353, referring to the most acute outbreak of bubonic plague, which is in 1347. And it's a series of vignettes and stories of people who are fleeing this, this uh, outbreak. They meet up and they start telling the stories and they're trying to grapple with it. You have another one by um, Daniel Defoe, A Journal of the Plague Year. This is borderline nonfiction. Uh, Defoe takes people's accounts of the 1665 to 1666 Great Plague of London and tries to recreate as realistically as possible in this, in this novel the experience of the bubonic plague uh, that year in London and how disruptive it is, uh, the fear and the anxiety. Moving forward to the 20th century, there is the uh, Albert Camus' The Plague. It's a little less concrete about what it's talking about, but people speculate that it's, even though it takes place in the 1940s, it's imagining a, the cholera outbreak in the 1840s as a kind of model for this behavior. And then last, but one I'm sure you've heard about a lot recently in the 1990s, is Richard Preston's The Hot Zone, where he's looking at Ebola outbreak that then goes abroad and imagines this hemorrhagic fever, kind of scary infectious disease and how it would be handled as a global pandemic threat. So in all of these, you have the authors taking, imagining their own period of time and how they would grapple with a pandemic. Uh, I should just say the first three are all available in ebook form. So if you're looking for something to do, um, you can go to Project Gutenberg and you can find these for free. Uh, I highly recommend them. Some features in them are the same. Infectious disease brings out antisocial behavior. In the Decameron, there are the wealthy aristocrats flight to the countryside. They leave the towns and cities. There is a collapse of social systems. People reflect 
sort of surprised at all of the antisocial behavior, priests who refuse to give last rites because they're running from the disease. There's also in all of these books this profound self-reflection about the moral meaning of disease. After the Black Death um, in 1348, in 1347, 1348, with this flight to the countryside, you have this anti-clerical and political revolts. People are questioning, you know, why would God do this to us? They start to think about this older pagan idea of fortuno, and maybe it's all random, and you can see this kind of um, doubt that comes in to try to make sense of how such a sort of horrific natural event that could exist given their moral beliefs. But there are definitely differences as well. So these books say as much or more about the cultures in which they happen as they do about the disease. This is because when a natural disaster intersects with a society, it takes on features of that social environment. This includes class stratification of hazards. If you have a hierarchical society, those at the top are going to be affected by disease differently than those at the bottom. It reflects people's perception of risk and the offsetting behaviors that they enact to avoid the disease. So if people think that it's an urban disease, they, fly, they flee to the countryside. If they think it's related to some immoral behavior, then they condemn those people for that immoral behavior. And it also reflects differences in political institutions. And I'm going to say more about this moving forward, looking at several uh, epidemics. So there are broad questions about epidemics that I would like to explore today. What is the role of disease in history? What role do diseases play in human history? How do natural disasters become social disasters? It may start as a natural disaster. This disease was not created by people. But as it moves through our society, we and our behavior shape the way this disease manifests. And then last but not least, what social and political responses have past societies had to epidemics? And how do those differ from or compare to our response today? Here you have an outline of the talk. I'm going to break this into three short videos. First, I want to talk about the beginnings of public health. So I'm going to describe traditional ways people reacted to epidemics, but then talk about how late in the 19th century and then into the 20th, you begin to get certain institutions that take on our modern ideas of public health and grappling with these outbreaks. Then I want to talk about past pandemics that are used as a precedent for today. And I'll focus on the 1918 Spanish influenza, but I also want to talk about the scaling up of public health responses with vaccination and certain eradication campaigns. And then I'll bring it to present by talking about the resurgence of pandemics today, starting with HIV AIDS in the 1980s, and then I'll reflect a little bit on our current pandemic of coronavirus. So there are a lot of possible starting points for this that I could have chosen in terms of talking about public health. There is a famous story about James Lind and the British Navy's experiments with limes and scurvy. This is before they knew about vitamin C, but they were starting to suspect that deficiencies in diet were affecting the Navy. This was one beginning to a kind of public health measures. Uh, Louis Pasteur and the invention of pasteurization. But to start you thinking about public health, I wanted to focus on three stories. The invention of vaccination, a famous study of a London cholera outbreak done by Jon Snow, and social mitigation strategies for tuberculosis that began in the early 20th century. Because I think these three incidences really speak to our current crisis. So before the 20th century, when there was an outbreak of some kind of disease, um, people like today would try to speculate about this, but they didn't have the model, the germ theory of disease that we had today. So they had different ways of understanding it, some of which might, you might recognize still. They often looked for what they would, you might call the usual suspects. They would tend to blame the poor, uh, the slovenly, the, and, and the unhygienic. They would look at urbanization was a problem in the 19th century, and they would claim that these slums with people who weren't sort of being good and clean were a breeding ground for these kinds of illnesses. They also tended to target outsiders and immigrants. You can see in the upper right a cartoon which depicts a pandemic coming from the foreign abroad and this effort by the New York Board of Health to try to create a barricade. Uh, and they would also blame 
sort of the corruption of people in a moral sense as giving rise to a corruption in a physical uh, sanitary sense. So their responses reflected these beliefs about what were epidemics a cause uh, for concern for. They would try to focus on urban cities as a kind of blight, a cultural corruptive site, and focus on polluted city centers and the, and the filthy poor. They implemented quarantine, and the word quarantine itself uh, comes from its Italian roots, uh, with the earliest quarantines happening during the, the Black Death uh, in Italy, especially in Venice. When ships would arrive, they would have to sit for 40 days at port, and quarantine quarant comes from the word 40 in Italian. So they would try to quarantine sites. Now, one thing to keep in mind when you're talking about these efforts to make meaning of disease is that there was a difference between the proximate causes. They would look at you know, these poor people who are unclean or these immigrants and the ultimate causes. And if you looked at the way people talked about the ultimate causes of disease in the early 19th century in America or most of the world, it was often framed in religious and moral terms. And there's a really excellent work uh, of literature by Charles Rosenberg called The Cholera Years, where he takes three outbreaks in New York City, the first in 1832, the second in 1849, and the last in 1866. And he shows how in the same city over these, these three different outbreaks, you have a very different reaction to them which isn't just because the outbreak is different, but also because people's ideas about disease and about New York City and whose responsibility it is to deal with this is changing. So at the beginning, they saw these diseases as sort of God, God's wrath upon uh, you know, immoral people, uh, the undeserving. They also saw it as this kind of profound uh, disruption. Over time, they start to focus more on what were, we could call before the proximate causes, um, and the idea that it was poor hygiene and sanitation. And they start to secularize their explanations of the disease in part to justify institutional interventions. Um, and so by the last outbreak, you start to have an institutionalized response. Um, if initially people's response was to flee to the countryside, by 1866, you have the New York City Board of Public Health attempting to implement measures to contain this or to prevent the spread, uh, measures that were more like what we would be seeing today. Um, so this is a beginning of a modern idea of public health, this idea that you don't just focus on the morality of it, but instead think about what are the mechanisms by which this disease is spreading, and then what measures can institutions take to, to, take to solve this. So the next, uh, one of the first big changes in, uh, in terms of how people handled epidemics was the rise of vaccination. And here the story sort of famously centers on Edward Jenner um, and the illness of smallpox. So smallpox was a huge problem um, in Europe and then in the New World and the Americas. And for a long time, people had been aware that if you take the pustules on people who are suffering smallpox. So these are like the, the blisters that would form on the skins of someone who was having a smallpox, a case of smallpox, and you open them and you took out that and you then applied it to a healthy person. That healthy person would get, get smallpox, but usually a much more mild case. This is known as a variolation. And so smallpox variolation, this is not the same as a vaccine, but it's a similar, it's the beginning of the idea of a vaccine. This had been going on in India and China for hundreds of years. Um, but in the uh, early 19th century, late 18th century, early 19th century, people began to realize that if we did this systematically, the chance of dying from this process of variolation was much lower than the chance of you dying if you got smallpox naturally. So people who had the postules applied to them from someone who's sick when they were healthy, there was only a 2 to 3% mortality. Now, compare that to 10 times the amount of mortality and death, so 20 to 30% of people dying if they got smallpox um, through exposure, natural exposure. So variolation was one measure that people were starting to use to reduce the outbreak. Now what Edward Jenner did was a little different. He discovered, he had heard anecdotally that milkmaids um, the women who were 
working with cows to get milk, often got a different disease known as cowpox. It was not deadly. And for reasons they didn't fully understand, for whatever reason, uh, these milkmaids were much less likely to get smallpox. And so the, the theory was that something about exposure to cowpox reduced your risk of getting smallpox and also your risk of, of, of dying. So Edward Jenner basically took, just like with variolation with smallpox, he took postules from the cowpox and he ran a famous experiment on May of 1796 where he vaccinated, he, he took this cowpox exposure to the eight-year-old son of his gardener, James Phipps, um, and with this material from a milkmaid who had had cowpox, he vaccinated the eight-year-old. And then, and this is the part that's more ethically controversial, at weeks later, he deliberately infected the eight-year-old with smallpox to see if he would develop the disease. So this was the full test of uh, the disease. This is why today, vaccines take so long. Uh, it is not enough to produce a vaccine. You also then need to run at least a year-long trial to see if the vaccine works. Edward Jenner has only waited a few weeks. Um, if they come up with a vaccine for coronavirus, they, they will need to run at least a 12-month cycle. And miraculously, the eight-year-old did not get smallpox. And out of this, Edward Jenner started becoming a proponent and others um, of vaccination through this process. So cowpox vaccination, conferred immunity. Um, the word vac, vaccination, comes from the Latin word for cow, and this is why this word vaccination exists, because of the cowpox. Now, keep in mind, vaccination, modern vaccinations for smallpox have no risk. So variolation was slightly risky, cowpox was much less risky, um, and modern day vaccinations contain a dead version of um, the virus, and so there's no risk from this. Um, now, interestingly, the same thing that happened with smallpox was found to be true for tuberculosis. So the milkmaids also seemed to have a resistance to tuberculosis because there was a cow version of tuberculosis, and people then took this cow version of tuberculosis and created a, a, a debilitated live culture of this um, known as the Bacillus calmegerin, or BCG vaccine at the beginning of the 20th century, and in many countries, people would receive this BCG vaccine. And I mention this because there has been one that you might be hearing about this in the news. There have been studies underway to see if this vaccine, which is known to confer resistance to other respiratory illnesses, might help out and reduce the severity of coronavirus. Okay, so this is the beginning of vaccinations, which will be important for public health campaigns to try to reduce epidemics. Now, the next story is about a man who came to rescue us from a deadly natural force that was spreading rapidly, Jon Snow. No, wait, not this Jon Snow. Sorry, my apologies, but this Jon Snow. So Jon Snow was an English physician. He's widely considered the founder of epidemiology uh, because in the 19th century, he sort of famously charted out an outbreak of cholera bacteria in London in 1845, 1854. Now, at the time, the common theory about cholera was that it spread through miasma, or bad air. Uh, and this was the sort of thought for cholera and the bubonic plague. The word malaria is Italian for bad air, so this was a common way of understanding how diseases spread, was that the airs in this particular were bad. It mapped on to how people thought about urbanization in cities because London had very bad air in the 19th century, so it was seen to reflect that. However, Snow thought, instead of it being air, that it was much more like it was traveling through water. And what he did is he created this map of this neighborhood in London that was very hard hit. He interviewed people, and he determined that, that they had all used the same water pump. He also used a microscope, these new microscopes, to view microbes in the water, but these this was the resolution of these microscopes was not so great, so it wasn't so definitive. Um, but it was the detective work that he did. He, he looked at people in the neighborhood who didn't get sick. Uh, a famous example is this was that men who worked at a brewery, so men who lived in this neighborhood, but they worked at a brewery, and therefore they spent much of the day drinking beer at the brewery or water from the brewery, which had a different well. These men didn't get sick. And so this confirmed or, or added evidence to his theory that it was not the air, but actually the water. 
And then he famously, people weren't sure they agreed with him, but he was able to convince the city to remove the force rod handle of that pump of the well that he traced back as being the outbreak source. And very quickly, the outbreak ended. And this was a kind of triumph of his method. And this would become the best basic methodology of epidemiology, tracing the source of an outbreak uh, to try to then contain it. It had an important impact for public sanitation, for disease, because it was further evidence of the need to create better infrastructure, sewage, clean municipal waters, which would become really common and important late in the 19th century and into the early 20th century. All right, moving forward into the early 20th century. So you have the beginning of these public health uh, entities, particularly at the city level, and you start to get problems about how do you enforce these concerns about disease outbreaks. And part of those problems tie up with uh, other bigger problems that are happening in, in cities. So a good example of this can be seen with milk in, in, in urban centers. And there were a series of scandals in the 19th century around what was called swill milk. This is just sort of bad old milk that these industrial milk producers were selling in the city. Uh, some of them were quite alarming. In 1858 in New York City, uh, one news story talked about how 8,000 babies had died because of swill milk contamination. Um, keep in mind, for the poor, cow milk was the main source of food. Um, and so the, this swill milk, which was caused by these poorly treated cows, was actually bluish in color. And subsequently, it was found, uh, not at the time, but later, that it was contaminated with chemicals, but also potentially with tuberculosis. Now, one solution that came to this concern about swill milk was pasteurization. By the late, late 19th century, uh, people started drawing upon Louis Pasteur, this French researcher's uh, studies in pasteurization, which is that if you slightly heat the milk, then the bacteria in it will die, and these microbes will die, and therefore pasteurizing milk was a way that you could sell industrial milk uh, without risk of it. But even with this process, there was this continued concern about how do you fight these invisible microbes? Um, how much is this the fault of this industrial production that's contaminating the foods that are coming in at a large scale? But you also get what one historian called this gospel of germs. So by the late 1800s, people can tell that there are these small microorganisms that move around that are pathogens and they're invisible. And then if they infect our bodies, then we get sick. And this creates a profound cultural anxiety about what do you do about these invisible pathogens. With science, we can see them. Um, without science, the unaided eye um, is unable to see them and we're vulnerable. And it's not just a medical and scientific paradigm shift. It's also a cultural paradigm shift. Now, people become concerned about whether their food is a source of contamination, about the people around them, and whether those people are, are unsafe. And you get a wide range of policy measures introduced. One of them, like I said, was pasteurization of milk. Another were municipal codes for cleanliness at places where food and drink was served. This is the famous sign that we now all see on the door, employees must wash their hands. Well, in the early 20th century, people were campaigning that we needed to make these sort of legally enforced to make sure that... Uh, we weren't exposed to the bad hygiene of others. Um, you also have the application of this outbreak model for public health. So the public health institutions are now doing detective work to figure out where diseases are coming and who's responsible for, for stopping them. And it had a cultural impact. You, the expression cleanliness is next to godliness existed before this, but it gets elevated this kind of super value. Um, you see a change in bathrooms before or after this movement, you start to have more bathrooms that are white because there's a sense that you can see filth. And if you can see filth, you can clean it. And therefore, by cleaning it, you'll reduce these germs. Um, hotels are required to change out their bed sheets every time. I can hear you thinking that's gross. Um, but also things like folding the covers of the bed sheets is something that comes from the time of tuberculosis, where when people were coughing, the, the cough would spill over onto the covers. By folding the covers, you're sending a signal to your customer that this is clean underneath, uh, so that when you come into the room, you know you have a clean bed. Um, now, part of these anxieties is not just scientific. 
the cultural historians and anthropologists say that there is a much deeper you know, cultural preoccupation known as the law of contagion. And the law of contagion is this magical law that suggests that once two people or objects have been in contact, there's a kind of link that persists between them. So if I'm a filthy person and I touch an object and then someone else sees me touch that object, they're going to feel, if they're repulsed by me, they're going to feel repulsed by the thing I touch. And this operates beyond just a sort of sense of contagion and disease. Um, this is why people don't want sort of, you know, repulsive people handling their things. It, it tends to cause this kind of gross reaction. And in a way, this germ theory confirmed this deeper cultural sentiment. Um, again, in other ways, the the law of contagion is not just about contamination. It's, it's about this kind of sense that I don't, you know, should I be worried about the domestic worker? Should I be worried about these poor people who are making my foods in this invisible backstage industrial system? Which brings me to this important story about Mary Millen. So Mary Mullen was an Irish immigrant and domestic servant. Uh, and in the early 1900s, she, she lived in New York City. She immigrated there from Ireland. And she was working for different families. And uh, civil servants and engineers who were working in New York City uh, trace back Mullen's employment history. And, and they find that a series of typhoid outbreaks had actually followed her from job to job. So from 1900 to 1907, this civil servant found that Mellon had worked at seven jobs in which 22 people had become ill, including one young girl who died with typhoid fever shortly after she had come to work for this family. Uh, and this, of course, led the civil servant to say, well, we can't allow this. Clearly, this woman is, is, is causing these people you know, danger. And so they arrest her by force against her will, and she's held without a trial. Now, again, Mary Millen has not broken any laws. So this question becomes, you know, how can the government lock her up in isolation? They do this presumably indefinitely because there was no, no trial. And this was in 1907. In February 1910, you get a new public health commissioner who decides that this is a, a violation of her liberties. She says she can go free as long as she agrees never to work as a cook again. Um, they don't know why, but for some reason, Mary Millen is... A, a, a silent carrier of this um, of typhoid. She herself doesn't have any symptoms, um, and they say, "Well, you can go free as long as you don't work as a cook again." Um, Melon accepts the conditions, but then shortly thereafter, she does become a cook again. Keep in mind, she is a poor immigrant. There are only certain skills and jobs open to her, but again, she starts to reinfect people again, and so she was arrested. And this time, she's treated as guilty and uh, willfully endangering others and is sent uh, to an island where she's isolated for 23 years. And this is the question, right? Does the state have the power to lock up these otherwise healthy people who are carriers who potentially are infecting others? Now, this person, uh, Mary Malin, is better known today as Typhoid Mary. And, and why is she remembered as Typhoid Mary? This is a kind of negative, infamous label for her. Um, was it because of what seems like this sort of reckless behavior by her? Um, is it fair that this otherwise healthy carrier is being isolated for life? Uh, historians have written about this and argue that it's not just that she was um, infecting these people and a health hazard to middle-class and upper-class people. Um, it was significant that she was Irish and she was a woman. She was a domestic servant. She didn't have a family. Um, she couldn't be considered a, br a bread earner. Um, th there, people didn't take seriously her need to, to do these jobs. Um, and all of these things help contribute to this kind of infamous idea of her as this reckless, dangerous health hazard. Um, she experienced extreme punishment for something in which she had no control over uh, and has gone down in history as this evasive, malicious person. Um, but when you think about it, without breaking the law, she was sentenced to a lifetime in isolation um, for these, these activities. And this was the kind of struggle you have in the early 20th century in America. You have these infectious diseases that are spreading, and you have public health measures that infringe on people's individual liberties. And so there is a landmark Supreme Court case known as Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905. Um, in this case, you have 
individual citizens who have to undergo vaccination in Massachusetts. If they don't, they have to pay $5, which is a lot. And one citizen, Jacobson, refuses. He says, I'm religious. I, I cannot uh, do this vaccination uh, for smallpox. Um, he says, it's an assault on my body, and therefore this is a violation of my liberties. Um, and the courts rule on this, and they argue that smallpox is like an invading army, and the state has the authority to protect the public and therefore compel individuals, regardless of your religion, to do this. And they have this famous expression here where they say, the liberty secured by the Constitution of the United States to every person within its jurisdiction does not impart an absolute right in each person to be, at all times and in all circumstances, wholly free from constraint. There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. On any other basis, organized society could not exist with safety to its members. Society based on the rule that each one is a law unto himself would soon be confronted with disorder and anarchy. In this expression, manifold restraints said by Justice John Marshall Harlan became a kind of um, classic expression in Supreme Court common law in the United States to say that the state has a right to impose certain public health measures in certain times. Now, I don't have time to talk about this here, but you, if you've watched the biotech plenary, uh, I mention this movement of eugenics, um, racialized, racial-based science, this idea of uh, this now discredited idea that science could be used to improve racial breeds um, in humans. And during the period of Jacobson, you have this broader context of what can the state do in terms of ensuring the, the public health. And one of those is, as I mentioned in the biotech lecture, uh, forced sterilization. So the same kind of reasoning you have in Jacobson could be extended to other circumstances to say, well, people who are a burden on the state um, because they have mental health problems and they live in, uh, in uh, sanitary hospitals, um, maybe we can sterilize the, those people and prevent them from giving birth and creating more problems for the state. And this has moved forward over 100 years through a lot of different cases in different contexts. Uh, in the 1970s, there is a case uh, that basically argued that everyone who rides a motorcycle has to wear a helmet. Uh, and the argument in, in that case was um, that you know, individuals may be free to choose whether or not they expose themselves to higher risk of serious injury, but the problem is this translates into a burden for the public when these individuals are seriously injured in an accident. Uh, and insurance companies, hospitals, the state uh, have to pay huge medical and rehabilitation bills. Uh, in this case, the, the justices ruled that from the moment of injury, society picks the person up off the highway, delivers him to a municipal hospital and municipal doctors, provides him with unemployment compensation if after recovery he cannot replace his lost job. And if the injury case causes permanent disability, they may have resume responsibility for his and his family's continu continued substance. We do not understand a state of mind that permits a plaintiff to think that only he himself is concerned. So for these reasons, the, the court argued that under manifold restraints, people have to wear a motorcycle helmet. And you can see this with seat belts. If you're a driver, you have to wear a seat belt. Um, if you're a student and you want to go into university, they might require you to do a tuberculosis test that you can see here, the skin prick test. Um, or I am a parent now with a newborn baby and I have to buy this very expensive baby seat and install it in the car. Um, the idea being that baby children are too young to make decisions for themselves and the state is concerned about the extra risk that it has with them in the car. So all of these are examples of this idea of a social concern about individual liberties and the cost they have for the public's health. Now, what I want you to do before we wrap up this section is to sort of take a moment and pause the video and try to think, what rights do you think the state can or cannot infringe in order to stop an epidemic? Um, write down as some of the things that you think are, you know, if an epidemic is coming or like this pandemic, what are some rights that you think that the state has, you know, on one side you can make a list, can, you know, remove or, or infringe upon, or what are some rights that you think must be respected at all costs, even if it means a danger for the public's health. And then 
Another question I want you to take a moment to think about is, should those rules apply equally to everyone? Should those rights be protected or infringed equally for all, or are there people who, in your opinion, are more or less deserving of protections? Um, for example, we treat the risk of smoking tobacco and alcohol as something that ordinary adults can do, but we restrict minors and people under 21 because we feel that these people aren't mature enough yet to make the decisions to engage in this harmful activity, right? Smoking and tobacco is dangerous. It can kill people. If you're over a certain age, we say that's fine. You can take that risk. But under a certain age, we would infringe on your liberties. So is it fair for a pandemic for us to target certain communities or sub-communities? And if you think so, why? Okay, so I'm going to pause this lecture here. And in the next part, we're going to pick this up, starting to think about past precedents and what those past pandemics say for our present pandemic.